this time I, I listened to all those audios that I made and posted and just like you you know just because I speak it doesn't you know that's how I learn you're hearing it from another voice I have to be a voice but I also am learning that way you're learning by only hearing it I have to learn it by speaking it and then hearing it which kinda of means I'm worse than you anyway um this particular increment is going to be about um, the impact of this whole issue of God deeds versus good deeds in the relationship in the trial again because it's still the same topic there's so many facets but the increment here is going to focus on the actual daily function I think you got it by now if you really bother to listen that there's another way of living the spiritual life that we are not hearing about that when you think it over is about as improbable as it gets as weird as it could possibly be on the surface but nothing else makes sense when you think it over okay I mean it makes sense to say that God didn't make us to do pet tricks because if he did we'd not be as low and weak as we are it makes sense to say God didn't make us to be Stepford wives who couldn't sin because if he if that if if he had wanted that that's what we'd be you get this so the issue logically you have to conclude the issue is not about sin that's a cost of doing business all right when you go to the store you think a little bit about the hassle of going to the store but you conclude that it's a cost of getting what you want so the actual cost and hassle of going to the store is not the factor in your going it's an issue you deal with it and you go that's the same thing with sin here it's an issue he dealt with it and there's another objective you get that going to the store is an issue in getting what you want you have to figure out do you have enough gas in the car do you have enough money in your pocket do you need your credit card which credit card where are your car keys you have to get dressed you have all those cost issues and then of course it's what store and are you familiar with the things in the store how long is it going to take do you have enough time given what else you've got to do in the day you've got all those decisions to make and there are thousands of them just to go to the store And you conclude, yes, I'm going, or no, I'm not going, based on those costs. But your objective is entirely different from all the costs. Your objective is to get something from the store, something that you want. And you're basically making a decision that the thing that you want is worth all the trouble you go to to get it. You're with me on that. So your objective is not the whole cost question is a subunit of the bigger question of the thing that you want to get okay that's the same decision path that occurs when God decided to create okay he has to choose what to create well they're gonna he has to choose whether they're gonna be costs sin is a cost uh, is he willing to pay that cost because there's nobody else that can pay it the object that does the sin can't pay the cost you know if if your car gets wrecked you can't ask your car to pay for the cost of it being wrecked it doesn't work now and and a car can't pay for itself anyhow a car has to receive things you have to maintain it yourself you maintain the car the car doesn't maintain itself it's got certain things that other people did to it to make it run 
and then you have to do certain things to make it keep running. The car can never make itself run. The car can never make itself be. It is entirely a product of other people. The same thing is true for us. We are entirely a product of God. And there are hassles and costs that God has chosen to literally actually even create. He created the ability to sin. He created that. You couldn't sin if he didn't create it. That's Satan's big argument. Okay. So like going to the store, God created all the situations that he knew could happen, would happen, wouldn't happen. And he has to decide, you know, is this worth my time? What do I want? What do I get for all this hassle I'm going to go through? Is it worthwhile for me? And he obviously decided yes. Okay, so then the focus that we need to have, which is what goes back to the spiritual life being so different, is on what does it look like to God and why did he do this? What is he out for? What does he want to get from this? What does he get from this? And the Bible tells us, but we're not looking at it. It's not about behavior. It's not about whether you sin or not. Those are costs. Those are issues. But they're peripheral. What does he really want? What pleases him? Hebrews 11, 6. Learning and living on Bible. Matthew 4, 4. Getting the mind of Christ. 1 Corinthians 2, 16. Which just flew into my mind. That's what he wants. That's what pleases him. Your thinking like Christ pleases him. Everything else about you is a cost of doing business. Cost of going to the store. The product at the store is what you go for. You want to buy peanut butter at the store. How much trouble are you willing to go through to get that peanut butter? How much trouble is God willing to go to to get you so that you can think like Christ? Well, everything. Christ paid so that you could have a brain to start with. And then your whole lifetime or however long it took before you heard the gospel and believed in it, there was all that cost. And now there's all this cost of retooling your brain to think like Christ. And it's all entirely up to you. It's bi-directional. He's constantly hitting you with, with ideas and stuff to remind you and you're hearing him or you're not you know it's like 1% all the time 99% and you respond maybe 1% of the time I mean I don't know the percentage but it's really small because 99% of the time we're busy thinking about we gotta go to the dry cleaners we gotta get Johnny's haircut we gotta fix dinner we gotta get this email out you know we're not thinking about God because we got so much other stuff on our mind that we gotta pay attention to So to develop a bi-directional interface and then use it so that at the ultimate end, because this is how Christ actually lived, his mind was constantly, 100% of the time, on God and on whatever his body had to do, whatever his horizontal life had to be. From the time he was born, Hebrews 10.5, my pastor spent a lot of time on this. The day he was born, and this is one of the times he used his deity, he said, a body you prepared for me, O God. So he's linking God, thinking toward God, actually speaking from the cradle. That's what it says in the Greek, and that's what my pastor thought. It was very shocking. Very first thing out of his mouth when he's born, he talks like an adult using his deity, And that, of course, advertised to his mother and dad and the shepherds, if they were there. The Magi were not there. I've covered that in my synoptic videos. He's advertising, hi, I'm really God-man. First thing out of his mouth at birth. Day he was born. Okay? So he's linking his Godness and God in particular, talking to God the Father, He's linking those two things to his body. That's the life. 
Okay, but that's like learning to use Windows. All right, there's all kinds of commands and procedures and issues and, you know, there's thousands and thousands of, of little things you got to know to operate Windows. It, you don't learn it overnight. And, of course, you know, Windows is defective, so they don't exactly explain or make it clear how to use it. I mean, Windows Help is a joke. Everything that's in Windows Help you already knew intuitively. And the stuff that you need to know that isn't intuitive, they don't tell you. So you spend hours and hours guessing. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, so, it's like that in the spiritual life, too. How do you get to coordinate? It's like this in a job. It's like this with the piano. How do you coordinate your thinking so that you're thinking toward God and toward your horizontal life all at the same time? In a pas de deux. In like ballet. And the answer is you don't. It's one or the other. I mean, if God gets a nod on Sunday... You know, the pastor talks and it goes in one ear and out the other. And you pat yourself on the back for having been there like doing a laundry chore. Think you're holy. Which means you have absolutely no thought about God at all. You're evaluating everything in terms of self-worth. That's not bidirectional. That's not vertical. So how does this thing actually work? Well, it works pretty much the same way everything else does. Because God was pretty smart about the procedure, designing the procedure. Anything you do in life is going to require part of your mind in several different places at once. When you're watching a movie, you're usually drinking something or eating something or doing something on the computer, multitasking. The whole idea of multitasking. You're always multitasking. Your mind is on many things at once. It, 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 except when you're asleep. Alright, and maybe even then. So, it's a question of training your brain, which is a volitional act on your part, to pay attention to certain things but not others. Because your brain is constantly getting input from a lot of sources. You know, if you're in an apartment building, your neighbor two doors down has a barking dog and you learn to tune that out. Or your kids are in the next room playing some Nintendo game very loudly and you learn to tune that out. You know, you learn to tune in and tune out from the TV while it's talking. Tune in and tune out from the sound of dishes in the kitchen. You know, you, you, you become volitionally selective. You're aware of a lot of things at once. You become volitionally selective about what you hear and how to interpret it. Your brain is constantly getting input from many sources. And you're volitionally choosing what to pay attention to and how. And how often and how much. You're also choosing how to interpret that input. How much of it do you want to interpret? How do you want to interpret? You're literally creating your own brain and all of its pathways every second you breathe, whether you know it or not. You're making thousands of decisions a minute. So that's your hard wiring. That's the way you are as a human being. Of course, with God, it's you know infinitely bigger than that, all at the same time. So that's what you have in common with God. Okay? That's an essential structure of how the soul works. How it, in, how it interacts with your environment. Okay? The ultimate decision maker is really you. You don't feel like you're in control, but you are. You're making constant decisions about how to interpret all the input you're getting. You're making constant decisions about what to output in your thinking, in your thoughts, in your deeds. All the time. So now it's a question of choosing to learn God's thinking 
or not. That's the whole story. And then you have the next choice about choosing to integrate what you're learning with the rest of your life. My pastor liked to call this the merge. And what he kept on in 1999 and following, he he really came up with some really revolutionary stuff that I can't find anybody else um, in Christendom recognizing. Um, The whole idea is to get it integrated into your life. And that basic concept is something that every denomination is trying to do with its version of things. You know, I mean, that's the heart of Catholicism, really. <clears throat> but in the real spiritual sense of it, it's the idea of, hi, you're sitting on the toilet. What does that have to do with God? Again, going back to Christ at birth, the first thing out of his mouth, he talks to Father. He's relating his Father to his body. He's saying his body is designed for Father, a body you prepared for me. Well, if that's the role for Christ, what do you think is the role for us? My body is an appendage to my soul. God created it that way. I am basically a spoon with volition, and God uses me as a spoon. And I'd rather be a spoon with volition in God's hands than be anything else in my own hands. Okay, but that attitude didn't wasn't my attitude in the beginning. In the beginning, I had nothing. When I was born, I didn't have anything. A lot of feelings. I don't know. I don't know anything when I'm born. No baby does. A baby is just a sponge. It, 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 it gets in a lot of input. It has absolutely no ability to interpret it or use it. What it can do and does do is imitate. It takes in a lot of information and after, you know, five days, a month, it starts trying to imitate all that input. It's fascinated by everything. It's got these big blue or green or brown eyes that you can look at a baby and know it's empty. You just look at those eyes and they're gorgeous and they're empty. And so it gets all this input and and after a while it wants to repeat the input it gets. It tries. It tries to talk. It makes sounds. Okay? It starts to respond to the faces it sees. Okay? And after a couple of months there's some there's some more imitation that goes on and at about an eight months, nine months, a year it starts to try to imitate the walking that it sees. It's an imitator. That's what a baby is. Okay, that's what you are as a spiritual baby too. That's why it's so important to ask God who's your right teacher. Because you're going to start imitating your teacher. You're going to imitate the Christians around you. And you cannot discern the good Christian from the bad Christian. You can't discern the apostate from the non-apostate. So a lot of people, when they first become Christians, whoever led them to Christ, that's the way they're going to think about it, they're going to want to imitate that person. Okay, but, you know, a drunk in Calcutta can give you the gospel correctly. You're not going to want to imitate the drunk in Calcutta. So a lot of people are employed, you know, everybody's employed by God for something. And there are a whole lot of apostate people who can correctly give you the gospel. Even an atheist can correctly give you the gospel. But when you believe in the gospel, the person who gave it to you, that you recognize gave it to you, you're going to want to imitate. Just like the baby wants to imitate the faces around him. And you can get really quickly, and they always do, you can get really quickly into false doctrine and you won't know. And what false doctrine always does is it separates. It's the opposite of Hebrews 10.5. It separates what you think from what you do. It separates God from what you do in the name of God. The big stress by every apostate group, 
which is 99.9% .9 of Christianity, their big stress is, oh, you believe in Christ, even if they get the gospel right, and that's all it is, is belief. They will start pushing you to do something. You gotta work around the church. You gotta knock on doors. You gotta do soul winning. You're not winning any souls. That's a lie from the pit of hell. Anybody who claims to be winning souls or doing soul winning is a big fat liar and is at the bottom of God's totem pole. There's no greater false doctrine than that. You don't win souls. God wins souls. You get the privilege of stating what God says. I'm stating stuff that God says. That, that's a thrill for me. Am I doing a good deed? Not at all. If you get something out of this, God did it to you. I'm not doing squat. I'm learning. And I have to talk about it to learn it. Other people just listen to learn. Alright? So you're a Christian baby, and some apostate was given the privilege to state the gospel to you. God caused you to be saved. God caused you to understand it. God caused the person to be able to say it right. And of course the person who's apostate saying it right is busy patting himself on the back as he said it right as if it was his good deed. And you, you got an empty soul like those big brown, blue, green eyes. You're so thrilled to be saved. You're so thrilled to understand it. And you're going to look at that apostate person and think that person is like, you know, a spiritual giant. Because compared to you, that person is. So what do you do? Well, that's just it. You don't do anything. You learn something. But you don't know that. So what, I'm, what am I getting at in this sort of meandering? I'm trying to explain two things. A, the spiritual life is what God does to you. And what he does to you is teach you. First thing Christ says out of his mouth is a linking of God the Father in his mind. In his mind to his body. Vertical linking up with horizontal. He's not doing any good deed at that moment. He's associating That's all he's doing. He's stating God the Father prepared him a body. What does that mean? God did something to him, right? First thing out of his mouth, a body you prepared for me. He's quoting Psalm 46. Actually, the whole psalm. Because that's a messianic psalm. That alerted everybody around him to the fact, yes, I'm Messiah. I'm God, man. I'm doing the supernatural thing at birth. You can see I'm God because a baby can't talk like that at birth. Baby can't quote scripture at birth. So that's supernatural. So that the shepherds could go out and give a good message. The mom and dad could have, you know, reassurance that, yeah, you know, this was okay. We didn't hallucinate all this meaning from God. It was reassuring. Okay, but that tells us, 2,000 years later, something else. God did it to him. A body you prepared for me. He's citing the fact that God does it to you. Scripture quoted. The baby had to get the scripture in his head from God in order to quote it. And it's scripture, not a good deed. The baby is not in the cradle, is not doing a good deed. He's citing scripture. Something God did to him. He's citing because God gave him the ability to cite it at birth. That's the pattern for the whole life. That's the first thing I'm trying to get across here. Second thing I'm trying to get across is that Christianity divorces the body from God doing it to you. In favor of you doing it yourself. That's Satan's plan, not God's. Hebrews 10.5 proves that right away. Christ. We all know Christ is number one, right? Okay, then how come Christ isn't citing good deeds at birth? Why is he citing the fact that God did something to him? So why aren't we following that pattern? 
That's the pattern of the spiritual life. That's the pattern of Christ. We all know Christ is number one. We all know we're supposed to be Christ-like. So why aren't we doing what Christ did? What would Jesus do? Jesus lived on Bible, Matthew 4.4. 4. Why aren't we? Why do we, five minutes after you're saved, you're going to be told by X number of Christians that you got to go out and hustle for God. You got to go out and give the gospel. You got to do good deeds. You got to be moral. You got to do this. You got to do that. Or you're not saved. Really? That's not what Christ said when he was born. Now you're born again. And you're being told a very different message, aren't you? You're being told a satanic message. Now. That's the story of 99.9% .9 of us, and I started out my second birth the same way as I'm talking to you about. That's what happened to me, too. I mean, I believe when I was a kid, but I didn't know that. My mother told me years later. But I knowingly believed in Christ when I was 18. And the first, second, after I knowingly believed in Christ, of course, I was enthusiastic about it. I wrongly had this really, you know, fawning attitude toward the person who gave me the gospel. And I immediately got into this whole Pentecostal nonsense. Because I didn't know any better. I mean, I really kind of did because I had a past, you know, going to different churches. Uh, let's see, I cycled through Catholicism, Congregationalism, Meth Methodism, the Baptist crowd, I, I forget all the other ones. I even experimented with Eastern religions by that point. But in all of that, I never really understood the Gospel. It wasn't until I was 18. As far as I could remember. You know, like I said, you know, years later I found out that I actually did know it when I was a kid and did believe. But when I was 18, I didn't know that. So I went through all that falseness. I was in with the Pentecostal crowd when I was 18. They laid hands on me. I spouted gibberish. Felt sick afterwards and it was like two weeks into that. I, I turned to my roommate and I said, you know, something's really wrong here. Yeah, because the Pentecostal thing is entirely satanic. Their idea of the Holy Spirit is that you're supposed to roll on the floor and spout gibberish. What, God is a circus dog? God's going to jump up and do little circles? And spot gibberish nobody understands? That wasn't even tongues when it was valid. Which was only valid until 70 AD, until scripture was completed. Okay, scripture was actually completed later, but I mean the bulk of scripture was completed by the time, you know, Paul died, which was 68 AD. And then after that came the John stuff. Okay. So, hello, God isn't going to roll on the floor and spout gibberish. There's nothing holy about that. If anything, it's insane. But I was a spiritual baby at 18. So the first two weeks, of course, I got out of it sooner, largely because I had had some upbringing and, and doctrine and it started to kick in. The first two weeks, I was an idiot. And then I started to get sick. I mean, not, not physically ill. I'd have all these horrible dreams at night. Really horrible. And, and I, that was God's way of, I don't know, alerting me. I mean, he didn't give me the dreams. I was being, it's a long story and it's really ugly. But the point was is that I'd wake up from the dreams and I'd realize that this thing with the Pentecostals was wrong. So I started looking into, well, what, what is this? I, what's the spiritual life? And, you know, as soon as I asked the question, I found out the answer.